Uh, my name is Ronan O'Neill and I, we are going to be doing the uh, problem with the ball and the block on the turntable and I'm going to be doing part one which is understanding the problem. So the first part in understanding the problem is we are going to point out our assumptions for the entire problem. Our first assumption is that we're going to be assuming the block is not moving on the turntable and that the ball does not move upwards as the spring unravels. So if my hand is the turntable and this is the block, we're going to assume that it is not moving at all, it's not going back and forth, it's not going side to side, it's going to stay in place. And the other uh, part of it is we're going to assume that the way the string is attached to, uh, or the way the string is attached to the ball right there is that it's going to go downwards, it's going to unravel that way instead of un uh, unraveling upwards. And the second assumption we're going to make is that Earth's gravity is going to be a force on all objects that are in our system and that it's going to create an uh, acceleration downwards. Uh, the next part of understanding the problem is understanding what our quantities are for the problem. So the first one is capital M, which is going to be the mass of the block. So that's this block right here on top of the turntable. Our next one is going to be lowercase m, which is going to be the mass of the ball, which is right here hanging off the string. Uh, our next one is going to be lowercase r, which is the radius of the ball. So that's going to be represented right there. And then we're going to have capital R, which is the radius of the turntable. So that's going to be right here. And then our final one, which we don't know yet because we haven't solved it, is the angular speed of the turntable. And we will use a question mark for it, but it can also be represented as omega. And then C, which is the final part of the problem, is our free body diagrams. So the first free body diagram I have here is the block capital M. And since it is an object in our system, we know that the force gravity is going to be pulling down on it. But since the block is not moving at all, it has to have a normal force going upwards. And then it also has force tension going this way from the string, which attaches it to the ball. And then finally, our last free body diagram is going to be the ball, which has the force gravity coming from its center of mass going downwards. And then it has a force tension from the string here going upwards. But since the ball is moving downwards towards the earth, we know that the... Uh, we know that the force of gravity has to be a lot larger than the force of tension since it is moving downwards. I'm Jordan Miller. Uh, I will be handling the second, the, handling the second part of the uh, project, which is the calculations. Um, initially, we have to start off by knowing our important laws and our equations. So what we have here initially is the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. The net torque is equal to inertia times by alpha. Uh, and then we have the net torque is also equal to R times F times sine theta, which we won't really need, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, additionally, since we're dealing with the ball, which is a hollow sphere, we have to have the inertia of a sphere equation, which is 2 over 3 mr squared. Uh, we also need to know that a of c, or the centripetal acceleration, is equal to the velocity squared divided by the radius, which we can also set equal to uh, omega squared times by the radius. Um, additionally, from previous knowledge, we know that alpha is equal to the tangential acceleration divided by r. So given these, we can solve our symbolic equations here uh, to get our answer later on. So for the block in this situation, we need to understand the net force. However, the ball will have net force as well as net torque since it's wrapped by the wire or the string. For part one, we can recognize the only force given with the centripetal acceleration would be a tension force because it's moving on the x-plane and not the y-plane. Plugging in our uh, centripetal acceleration, we get this equation here, uh, which gives us an opportunity, once we solve this, to input our omega, or our angular acceleration, for the block. Uh, the reason that we get m times omega squared times r is because of the fact that we don't have to use this equation because it's a 90 degree angle, or the angles are perpendicular to each other, so we don't need to use that equation. Um, Additionally, shown in part one, we could acknowledge that the net force within the y direction is zero, as I previously stated, not moving at all. Uh, now we have to move on to the ball. Since the ball is being pulled down by gravity and lowered within the y direction, the net force here in the y direction is equal to the negative mass times the tangential acceleration, which is equal then to the tension force minus mg. For the net torque on the ball, we have our net torque equation here, which we got from our previous laws and equations, and we can rewrite that as the uh, tension force times by the radius, 
And then we can take this and we want to solve for the tension force. So solving for the tension force and rearranging the equation, we get the tension force is equal to inertia times by alpha divided by r. Uh, and then using this rule up here, which we knew from our knowledge earlier, that the alpha is equal to tangential acceleration divided by the radius, we input it here and rewrite our equation. Additionally, we want to find out what a of t is. And we have a of t in our previous equation here for the net force. So if we rearrange this to solve for the tangential acceleration, we get that it equals negative tension force divided by m plus g. And now, inputting this into our previous equation, we get this equation here, which then through algebra and through simplification, in this process, we can solve for tension force. Now, we know since they're part of the same system and they're attached by the same string, uh, they have to have the same tension force, which means tension one is going to be equal to tension two. So we can set what we have from here equal to what we have from there, and we get this equation of tension equals tension. Now, we want to solve for omega. Omega is the goal of this problem. So solving this equation and rewriting it for omega is going to have dividing by m and dividing by r and then taking the square root, which will give us this equation here, which we can then use additional algebra and simplification to follow these steps to end up with our answer that omega is equal to the square root of 2 fifths mg divided by m times r. My name is Jacob Moss, and I'll be covering part three, which is our sense making. To begin our sense making process, let's start by taking a look at the units of the equation. Uh, the equation uh, Jordan found of omega is equal to the square root of 2 over 5 times mg over mr can be broken down into units of kilograms times meters over seconds squared all over uh, kilograms times meters, and it's all square rooted. Uh, after some simplification, we can get it broken down to just 1 over um, seconds which really is radians per second since we are dealing with angular velocity. Um, we know we're in the right place that way. Part B, we are looking at the numerical analysis uh, where we plug in values into each of the variables. For the sake of simplicity, we kept values easy and decided to go with 10 meters per second squared for gravity. The mass of the ball is one kilogram, the block two kilograms, and the distance of the rope is one meter. Plugging and chugging gave us uh, the square root of 20 over 10, which simplifies down to two radians per second squared, or sorry, not squared. Um, which is a fairly reasonable acceleration given these values. Finally, we can wrap up the sense making with some covariation reasoning. Uh, before we get to what is in the equation, I found it interesting to note that the, ball, the radius of the ball is not found in the final equation, meaning that no matter how dimensionally large the sphere on the end of that rope is, as long as all the other variables are the same, the angular velocity will not be affected. Uh, let's start by taking a look at the values in the numerator of the equation. Since the mass of the ball is in the numerator, uh, as it increases, we can expect to see an increase in the angular velocity, which would make sense if you were to add weight to the side of the ball that is, uh, or to the side of the system that is responsible for the force of the tension. Um, alongside the mass of the ball is gravity, which if we were on a planet with a greater gravity, we would, all, we would also expect to see the velocity increase, since the gravitational acceleration that's pulling that ball down increases. <clears throat> In the denominator, we first have the weight of the block, which has an inverse relationship with omega, uh, meaning that as it increases, we're going to see a decrease in that uh, angular velocity, which makes sense as you increase the, for or the weight on the opposite end of the system, you're going to have to take more work from that ball in order to move it. Um, and then last but not least, we have the radius on the bottom. Um, as the radius increases, we're going to see a decrease in angular velocity. And to sum it all up, all of our sense-making forms are checking out, which means we are in the right place, and all of our we are able to confirm that our answer is reasonable and accurate. Last but not least for our project, we're going to wrap up a part four, the reflection. Um, looking back at some of the previous homework and studio problems, we can notice some important relationships between them and this problem. The first similar problem I found came from homework one, activity number two, where we see a cyclist going down a conical slope. Uh, this was an early look at centripetal acceleration and relationships between that and tangential velocity. Um, we, were, we found it similar to our problem in those aspects. Another activity that was more closely related to this problem would be homework number three, activity number three, uh, where we also deal with the pulley system oriented in the same fashion. Uh, this problem dealt with torque, which we were able to almost directly relate to our problem since it was so similar, uh, and helped us guide us toward the solution that we ended up getting. Uh, the last similar problem I found was from Studio 4, problem number 2, um, and that's where we saw another pulley system, but this time angular motion was added into the equation, um, similar to the one that we found today. Um, the main difference was that rather than a block on one end, uh, both ends had a spool and exemplified how angular motion does not contribute to the translational motion of the object. Here that part isn't super important, but taking a look at angular motion in a similar fashion was helpful nonetheless.